All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's episode of Beginner Breakdown. As always, my name is Alex Mullery, and I am excited to be doing this lesson. Today, we're going to be talking about rooks. And I have found that of all the pieces, be it the queen, the pawns, the bishop, the knight, um, even the king, I think the rooks are one of the pieces that's a little harder to get adjusted to. I believe Yasser Serwan uh, said that he used to have clumsy rooks, and he would intentionally trade them off for some minor pieces so that he could feel better about what he was playing with. So I thought tonight we would start with that. I'm planning to do a small series on all of the pieces, kind of introducing us to each one, some of their fun little quirks and the individual things they do. Um, and we are going to get started with the Rook here. So just the real basics, right? If For those, everybody here should know, but if you don't, the Rook moves along all of the vertical and horizontal lines. So no diagonals, no weird knight jumps, um, but it's a very powerful piece. Uh, however, like we said, it can be a little clumsy if you don't know exactly how to use it. Um, for instance, let me give a question to the audience. What would you say is the rook's favorite phase of the game? So like opening, middle game, end game, which, when are rooks the best? Yeah, in the end game, rooks control a lot of space, and they're just very, very good at helping pawns get home and stopping the advance of opposing pieces. Uh, however, because they're powerful, right, some beginners make the mistake of wanting to play them really early, right? So I'm sure you've seen stuff where beginners will, like, bring out their queen right away and go for something really aggressive. Generally, this isn't a good idea, because even though the queen is a very powerful piece, uh, it doesn't have the support it needs from the rest of your pieces in your setup to get started early in the game. You need to give it a little support. And the same is with the rooks. So, has anyone ever encountered a game that went something like this? Yeah, yeah I think uh, a lot of us have seen these games. Some of us have played this game where a beginner will open up by pushing one of these side pawns with the goal of getting their rook out early, right? It makes sense from a very basic logic. This is a powerful piece. I'm going to slide it up and over, and I'm going to make some nice threats. Really, in the opening, it's going to just get in your way. Um, and so if you see this, what I always do is something like d5, and then they continue their plan, not noticing the discovery, and you just want a rook. So always be aware of that. Rooks do much better later in the game in the middle game, they start to shine because, one, they allow castling. So your king can get to safety and your rooks can start to move towards the files. And then in the end game, again, they control a lot of space. One of the key ideas for rooks is that they like to have an open file. And when I say an open file, I mean a file where there are no pawns uh, in the way, right? It's just a whole long line. The ranks are these horizontals on the board and the files are the verticals. So, in this position, what's the best move for white? What might you do? How come? Yeah, we're, we have rooks here and we want to open up this file. And funny enough, in this position, the computer actually thinks black's best move is to play e5. Instead of capturing this pawn back and like maintaining material, because uh, we're going to be able to hold on to this pawn, uh, black is much happier leaving this rook out of the game because if the rook invades, it's actually a really big problem. Uh, if they try the natural, just recapturing, how would you continue now? Yeah, and, and this is our second principle. So if you have rooks, there's two really basic things you want to remember. One, they like these open files. Uh, anytime there's not pawns in the way, it's going to really benefit a rook. Second thing is they love the seventh rank, uh, or the second, right, depending on which side you are. Um, and the reason for this is because this is where the pawns start. So they're going to be able to eat a lot of the pawns and put a lot of pressure, as you can see right now. The other reason is because usually the king's going to stay back here for most of the game. And if you can get a rook on the seventh, it's going to inhibit the king ever escaping, or it's at least going to make it harder. So the game could continue something like this. Black wants to defend their pawn. And third kind of key idea here, another good move 
Any suggestions here? Double up the rooks. Uh, so putting the rooks either on the same file or the same rank is always really strong because they support each other, uh, one, in just defending each other, but also they can then put a lot of pressure on whichever square they're aimed at. And this is the same with any pieces, like in a battery formation, like a bishop and a queen, or two rooks here. But just remembering that's amazing. So one, rooks like open files. So open up the files. Two, rooks like the seventh rank. Three, rooks like to be doubled. And if you can, if you can get doubled rooks on the seventh, then it's about lights out. So keep those things in mind, and that's uh, going to help you out. One more last note about this position. If black decided to take with this rook here and try and keep the file closed, it doesn't work because now this pawn hangs. And your rook's going to slide over to e1, and again, we're going to have the same really nice scenario. Okay, another really basic piece. It'll get a little more advanced as we go, but I want to start out with the basics. Is this two rooks versus a king idea. Uh, I was teaching this to a kids beginners class this weekend, and some of them were falling into some traps and just mistakes, so I wanted to at least go over the basic idea. But the first step, and this is really with any piece checkmates, um, but this in particular shows a really good example, is you want to create a box. Uh, it's what I call it. Create a wall, whatever you want to call it, but we want to make a box that stops the opposing king from having as much space. So after the move rook to a4, we basically cut the board in half, and this king is never going to be able to move forward. King moves to the side, and we now use our second rook to make the box smaller. And we're going to keep encroaching on this space and keep trying to push all the way to the very end until we get a checkmate. Now at this point, the problem with the rooks that doesn't happen with the queen is the king can attack the, the rooks, right? Uh, because the queen exerts pressure on the diagonals, the king can never approach her. So it's a little more simple to get a uh, checkmate with a queen, although there are greater stalemate risks. But with the rooks, you have to be careful. So in this position, what would you play if you had the white pieces? Okay, five. Uh, rook a5. Okay, so this is an okay move, but I actually think there's a better one. Uh, the reason I don't love rook a5 is it's still going to get the job done eventually, but our end goal is to keep making this box smaller. And as long as these rooks are actually connected here, they're in each other's way. So normally it's a good thing to have the rooks connected, right? You want them doubled because it gives a lot of power to what they're aiming at. In this case, uh, we don't need to do that. Um, sorry? Yeah. Uh, E5, did you say? B5. Yes, that's going to be the best move. Uh, and Arcane Doctrine, he said, doesn't you mean the other rook? That's a possibility. This is another move here. Uh, if we put the other rook to a5, and when we're doing notation or clarifying, if I wanted to be really precise, I would say the rook from h to a5, or rook from a to a5, something like that. In this case, if we put this rook, it's going to be a similar problem. Uh, we've just kind of created the same issue, but now the rooks are on the same line. It's not as bad because they're not actually in the way of moving forward, but it is a bit of a waste of a move, I think. Instead, b5, uh, like you corrected. Uh, this is a great idea. We're switching our rook to the other side of the board, and the king now has to walk all the way back over, and actually there just isn't enough time. Um, we're just going to be able to checkmate by this kind of ladder pattern, right? One step at a time, uh, lowering the box, Something else you don't want to do that some people will do is in like this kind of situation, they don't actually understand the goal. And so they might just come over here and keep trying to call check with the wrong rook. Something else you got to be aware of, right? This is never going to help us. We need to actually keep forcing the king to the edge. So something like this, and hopefully you understand the principle here. Nope, not the right move there questions about that. It's a, it's a more basic concept, but this is true if you have a queen and a rook or two rooks, uh, but it's just a super, super helpful thing. Okay, let's move on uh, to now something a little more tricky. This, is, this happens a lot, and one of the reasons I think it's important to talk about the rooks and why I wanted to do this before I talked about any other, other piece is because you end up with a lot of end games at all levels, but beginner as well, 
where there's just like a rook and a pawn or two on the board. Most of the pieces are cleared. One side has an advantage, and they're going to be able to use a piece like a rook, or maybe it's a few rooks. But um, in this case, it's a rook versus a pawn. In this example, uh, our, our job as white is to stop this pawn from promoting. Because if this pawn promotes, it's going to be probably a queen, and we are going to have to either keep our rook and risk losing the game or trade it away and make it a draw. So if you're in this position with white, what would be your strategy to stop the pawn? How would you try and win this game? Yeah, anybody. Feel free to shout it out. What what might you do? Maybe try to keep it behind the pawn. Okay, so how? I think first you know how to play King D seven. Okay, we have suggestion King D seven, we have suggestion rook E seven. Um we can call check. Let's look at E seven first really quick. We can call check really for the entire game. Um we can keep doing this, but black is, again, happy for a draw here. So that's not going to gain us any progress. Um, king to d7. All right. Uh, I will probably advance my king. Preparing to defend my pawn. How would you continue? All right. Oh, sorry. Here? Okay. Uh, I guess I will go here. Mm. So that's good. So I've lost the ability to come back and defend. Your rook's cut me off. So in that case, I might have to go here. Keep the pawn safe. Okay. Yeah, and now, once again, you're threatening to just mate me. Uh, so I have to move. Uh, you could even better at this point you can just check and we're going to win the pawn that's I, so i think there's lots of ways to win this um here's what my advice is if you're in this type of situation i think the easiest way to do it and again there's you can do it in a lot of ways i would start by cutting off the king one of the things that makes the rook so powerful is it controls this whole entire line and it literally just cuts across the board and says, you can never move here if I don't let you. So in this case, what is black to do? Because there's a big problem. If uh, black tries pushing the pawn, so let's say a5, and in this case, I don't need to do anything with the rook, so I'm just going to probably move my king. Um, and if you continue pushing the pawn, then... What I'm going to do is I'm going to move away and attack it once your king is too far so you can't defend it. If you push the pawn out, if you if you move the king, I'm just going to take the pawn. And if you push the pawn, then I'm going to get behind it. So the key is I keep the king trapped, and if you commit to pushing it too far, I can just attack and go behind. That's the first strategy. But if you play passively and decide, okay, I'm never going to actually move the pawn i'm just going to dawdle around right you have to be the one to stop me because it's going to be a draw otherwise so let's say uh so a5 and let's say king a7 what might you do here well here's what i would do um i'm going to move my king closer sort of like what we did last time and i'm going to create checkmate threats so in this case your king can't move this way you only have either move away or advance the pawn if you move away, well, thanks for making my life really easy. That's the game. Uh, if you move the pawn, then what would I do? Sorry? I would, uh... the yeah, it's the same thing we just looked at, right? I can attack the pawn now because your king's too far to defend it. And if you push, I'm just going to go right behind. Then this case is actually checkmate. Uh, so if you try to get out of checkmate, I'll take it. And 
then I'll just have my king and rook. And uh, we'll look at the king and rook, uh, how to win with this in a moment. But I want to look at a few more things with the king and the pawn. So again, hopefully that made sense. But the main principle, uh, there's lots of ways to do it. But I, what I think is the easiest, I advocate for a version of chess for beginners, just and really for anybody, called no stress chess. There's lots of ways to solve this problem. I think the easiest one is I'm just going to stop your king. If you push the pawn, I'm just going to wait until I can attack it so that you can't defend. And then I'll get behind it and win it. And if you decide to instead just kind of dawdle around with your king, then I'm going to put a mating threat on the board. And then I'm going to take the pawn anyway. Okay. Let's make this a little trickier. Now, the pawn's one square away from promotion. So instead of being all the way back here, now the pawn's ready to become a queen. How would you win this game as white? It's white to move. White to move. Yeah, if it's blacks to move, then they're just making a queen. So then white's losing. Okay, so yeah, this is a big question. We have the A file as an option, and we could also go to G1 to stop the pawn here. But you want to go to A1 or yeah, A8? Is there a reason you picked this one over G1? I think I think that okay, yeah, because I'm directly attacking the pawn. A8. My next move was a capture the pawn. Yeah. If I go to G, I'm giving them too much time to strike. Yeah, exactly. So in uh, there's no pressure, right? Yeah. On A8, uh, I'm threatening to take your pawn, and the king actually just can't defend it. Right. So I'm going to win it. You either push and I take it, or you move the king and I take it. Here, uh, let's say you're playing as black now, and your opponent doesn't understand this principle that rooks generally are going to want to be behind the pawns. So whichever way the pawn is pushing, the rook want to be behind it whether it's your own pawn or an opponent's. Um, so in this case, if you're playing and your opponent does something like this, how can black fight to make this a draw? Start defending the pawn with the king. Yeah, we're going to move closer to the pawn. I'm going to come here and attack it. I can't do this, uh, so if I come and attack it like this. Mm-hmm. And now there's nothing left. I can either take it now and accept the draw after king takes, or I can run away and let you promote, and it's going to be the same. So instead, uh, if here, uh, or sorry, yeah, if you come closer, the other thing I can do is I could start trying to check you, and that'll work to a point, right? I, I can keep checking you. That's fine. But, but then I have to remember, wait, I'm trying to win this game. <laughs> I don't have a way to do that now because um, I've lost my ability to come get behind the pawn. So this is also going to be a draw, but in this case, we actually want to win. And to do that, we just get behind the pawn, put on some pressure. Now let's escalate it even a little bit farther. Now your pawn's close to promotion, but you also have two more pawns over here we got to be worried about. So what can we do in this position to... Uh, to win. Do you think white can actually win here or is our best hope to get a draw? Okay, what would be your method? What would you want to try? Okay, so again, getting behind the pawn generally seems the best idea. Uh, okay. Um, so let's say here, a7, here. Okay, yeah, then you can just defend it. Yeah, so now you can't take my pawn here, so what do you do now? Move your king, but it's not going to work. Uh, move your king, but it's not going to work. Why not? Because he can move the king a2 and then promote and take the rook or b2. Yeah, so let's take a look at that. So here, the threat is now that he's going to promote. Is there anything we can do now? Uh, 
Maybe just. Mm. Are we? Is the white move? White to move. In this situation, how do you get well, the ri the problem is now if we take this pawn. No, no, no. Okay. King up. We're trying to go for a draw, right? We're trying to win. Oh, we're trying to win. Yeah, if, if you do this, if if you do this, I'm promoting. You have to trade. And uh, do you know how to win with two pawns? This is a very trivial win for Black because all I'm going to do is I'm going to push one, and I'm going to bring the king in. Because you can never take this one exactly. Yeah. My other one's going to be first. Yeah. Okay, so let's jump back a little bit. So the problem is, I liked getting behind the pawn, but then moving our king, we gave black a little bit too much time, I think. So let's look at an alternative first here real quick. If we want to try this way again, try and come from the side, this also isn't uh, really going to work. Because, push the pawn, I'm going to stop it. And it's going to be similar to last time. King b3, uh, and you only have two good options, right? If you continue this plan of, well, I don't know, I'm just going to trade the rook for the pawn, we're going to end up in the same situation as last time. And now black is easily winning. So instead of doing that, you have to bring the rook back over and accept that you're going to get a draw by just checking a bunch. Uh, you don't have to check every move, like right in this position. I, I could have checked, but I'm also just stopping the, the promotion. But as long as you're doing something that stops the pawn from promoting, it's going to be a draw. But again, we don't want to draw, we want to win. So rook c1 isn't good enough, rook a8. Yeah. Do you have a question? Okay. So here's the idea. So king b3, right, looking to promote the pawn. And here's the trick. We're going to call check. And black is now going to be faced with a bit of a problem. Because if black goes in front of the pawn at any point, what happens? He's stuck. The king is stuck and the pawn is stuck. So an example of that could be, yeah, let's say, yeah, let's say here. Yeah, king is stuck and pawn is stuck. Now the king can move here. Um, but as long as we leave this rook here, we're good. So now... Uh, we can come mess around with these pawns with our king. You can do this, I guess. Um, but we can kind of guard these pawns. More importantly, though, is we actually want to move our king over uh, and prepare to just mate you. If, if you move something like that, I guess I can come over. But I believe we're going to be okay. I'm going to get my king close enough that your king can still can't escape. And now my king is doing the job my rook was doing. You can promote if you want. You can push this pawn if you want. Well, now you have to move. Um, we have to be careful here. I actually don't want to take this pawn. Because then I'm going to get into some stalemating situations. Uh, but I'm happy to do... In this case, I have to figure out exactly how I would do it. I might go here with the idea that I'm going to move my king with check. So let's say something like this. Move our king with check. King goes here. And now I'm going to move him here to attack the pawn. Mm -hmm. If you push, I take it. If you don't, then I... Actually, well, yeah, I can checkmate anyway. Um, but yeah, it doesn't really make a difference now. You actually can't... You just can't stop checkmate. So that's kind of the, the special idea, is we want to keep an eye on uh, moving our king over. And once our king is doing the job our rook's doing, it's going to clean up the pawns that are a threat and let the other ones run so we can get a stalemate. And we can see a similar thing. If you move the king away, right, so that was what happens if you trap the king. If the king comes out, then we have an option. We could check, but we're going to do that forever, so we don't want to do that. So we're actually going to go back and threaten the pawn. Rook to a8. And the king can come to b2. And we're going to threaten the pawn again. We're going to move our king in eventually. Just keeping it so you can't promote. King comes down to b2. We got to check again. King to c1. Rook to c8. We're going to keep checking. We're going to keep guarding the pawn. 
And if they, again, if they ever go here, then it's going to be uh, the white just wins because now our, we can just bring our king in and we're going to stop the pawns and we're going to get checkmate. However, it is unfortunate, but it is true that this is actually a draw. White, it, with best play, white's not going to be able to win because we do have too much to guard. However, like we said, there's a lot of traps that black can fall into. So we can stop the pawn. In this case, we just can't win. But considering that we're going against three past pawns and one of them is very close to promotion, this is still an impressive feat for this rook. So questions about this endgame? King and uh, king and rook versus some pawns. Can you show the draw? Yeah, so it's uh, just this idea, right? We're going to stop the pawn and we're going to check or attack the pawn. If the king ever goes in front, then white wins. So the king has to keep running away, and we're just going to keep doing this. Um, we can bring the king in if we want. It doesn't really matter. As long as we stop the pawn, um, we're just going to keep repeating this forever. Does that make sense? So, unfortunately, white can't win this. Yeah, uh, unless he goes, because there's no other way to make progress. We, we don't have enough time to, you know, guard these pawns and yeah. stop promotion. Okay, uh, really important point now. We've talked about what to do in a lot of these situations. We have king and pawn versus king, and a lot of the time we're going to be able to win them by getting rid of the pawns. But once we've done that, how do you actually win this endgame? So instead of having our second rook here, where we can just keep going up one and making these lines, making the box smaller, with only one rook, it's a lot harder. Uh, so... Does anyone, does everyone in here feel confident that you can win with a king and a rook, or is anyone not sure? All right, Neville, do you feel like you got it? What about you? Yeah. Do you know how? Like, do you feel confident? Um, yeah, um, I, I don't know how, but... Sure. I know you have to use the king, um, be pushing the king to the edge of the board. Yeah, so let's... And uh, Arcane Doctrine, Dreaded Endgame. I'm hoping that I can make this feel a little better for you, right? This does happen. My chess coach, when I was first learning, actually taught me when I was in these types of situations where I was, like, going to promote. He said, promote to a rook. Because if you promote to a queen, it's actually a lot easier to stalemate as a beginner. So I would give that same advice, but you got to know how to do it. And it's the idea is very similar. We're going to start out, we're going to make a box. Same thing as last time. Here's the difference. Uh, why don't you give me a move for black? Do you want the king to approach the rook, run away? Let's approach. Okay. So now I can't keep making it smaller. I don't have anything else. So I need to bring my king in to support the rook. Because again, the difference between the rook and the queen is the rook's not defended diagonally. So the king's going to get to us. I'll move my king up. Okay, now where do you want to go? Attack. Attack. I actually think this isn't as good a move because now I'm going to slide over. And now the box is a lot smaller. So now we're working on a box with uh, four dimensions, right? Or yeah. four sides. This is the ultimate box we're working towards. And now I know I am pushing you towards this corner. If you come back and approach, uh, I'm going to take this position. This is called opposition. Arcane Doctrine, it is possible to stalemate, but it's a lot harder. And I'll show you why when we get to the edge of the board. Um... This is a key position to remember, where we have our kings facing each other, and uh, the rook's just right here. This is called opposition. It comes up in a lot of king and pawn endgames, but also in this position. And the important thing is you always want to be the one to take opposition. You want to be the one to make the move that puts us in this position. Because now we have control. The black king has to move away. So where do you want to move? Back, diagonal, sideways? Where would you like to go? All right, let's go to G5. So here's the questions I ask myself. I start out, I have to make a box, and then I have essentially like three or four questions. The first question is, can I make the box smaller? Mm -hmm. If I can, unless the king's on the edge of the board. If I can, then I do so. In this case, can we make the box smaller? Yep. We're going to make it one square smaller. Okay, uh, now where do you want the king to go? Let's have him go back, because we don't want the, the king doesn't want to be on the edge of the board. Let's put him back. Uh, in the second case, 
uh, or in this case again, I'm going to ask, can I make the box any smaller? The answer is, yeah. okay, you say yes. If you move king, G4. Yeah, so this, so the answer is yes and no. Right? I can't make it smaller with the rook, but I can actually make it a little smaller with the king. Um, in this case, I'm taking away this square and this square that the rook aren't doing. So in, in a way, I am making the box smaller, right? Um, but I'm not using the rook, so I can't make the box smaller with the rook. My next question is, I'm going to try and put the king in opposition, because that is, again, going to remove some of these squares. Okay, king moves back again. Can I make the box smaller? I can, so I'm going to do it. And now, black puts their king in opposition. This is the only tricky part to this whole endgame. If you know how to deal with this, you're going to be fine. Because the problem is, what, what move do you play here? We now have to move our king or our rook, but the box is as small as it can be. So we would much rather black have to move and we can keep pushing them away. And we can shuffle around, but we're never going to get anywhere. Uh, so go back. Okay. Uh, I will go here. And then okay. And then king up. Here? Yeah. All right. I'm going to take opposition again. And then repeat. So that's one way. There's a few methods to do it. What I think is the simplest way that I know, and you can kind of be fancy with the rook, but you do have to be a little careful, is I just do this thing called triangulation, where essentially what needs to happen is I need to reach this position with, with white uh, not being the one having to move, where black has to move. And I do that by losing a move. So I'm going to make three moves with my king while you make two. I'm going to go to the side. Whichever way you go, uh, let's pretend we're not on the edge of the board here. All right, let's actually just go back. I'm just going to set up something um, here. Okay. So in this position, I'm going to triangulate. I'm going to move my king to the side, and I'm going to move it down, and I'm going to come back. And this is going to take three moves. So if you do something like this, I go back, and now I'm the one who has opposition. And you have to move away. There's other ways to deal with it. Um, in this case, I might go here. Um, if they take opposition, I'm just going to give it to them real quick. You can also back off and then make the box smaller. There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, but knowing the key of like needing to lose a move is really helpful. Okay, but let's get to the edge of the board. So what happens once we push the king all the way to the edge? Because that's... Like, maybe you can figure it out, even if you don't know much of the rest. But let's say we get the king to the edge of the board. Um, in this case, it would actually be mate in two, because I would push my king up and then get checkmate. But let's say it's not that simple. I'm going to go... I'm, I want black to have opposition here. Or no, wait, I don't. I want white to have opposition here, because then it's just checkmate one. All right, let's just say it's this position. White to move, how do I win this game? I've gotten the king on the edge. The rook is trapping him there. What do I need to do to win this game? Any suggestions? Um, F6, king F6. Okay, so king in opposition. And then... Um, Okay, like opposition again. Now, if we keep taking opposition, they're just going to shuffle back. So we need to do something to make progress here. Okay, let's, we can make the box smaller. Um, F6, king F6. All right. I'll take opposition. Um, I can do it. Okay. Now it's white to move. We triangulated so they lost opposition. Right, we can make the box smaller. Uh, we can triangulate here again, and that's actually going to be the key. Because if we go here, it's just going to shuffle. Um, 
but there's kind of two ways to do this. In this position, you can either triangulate, they go to the corner and we checkmate, or um, you can also do it like this. We can take, uh, or sorry, they go back. We can take opposition and then give it to them. And then what's another way we can lose a move in this position? Without, yeah. Rook literally anywhere on this line, except for here. Because their move is going to be the same. So we just drop back anywhere we want. And this is going to be checkmate. If that's still too confusing, um, at, oh, real quick, Arcane Doctrine. Here's the answer to your question. Uh, this is how you make stalemate in this position. You make the box smaller here. That's the really the only way you can stalemate this. Um, so that's why I think I like this better as a beginner because there's much. It's much harder to do this naturally. You're you're gonna know they have no moves. Um, what actually happens more often with beginners is they'll leave the rook undefended and then it's just a draw by insufficient material. Uh, if the king doesn't have to be in the corner though. You can also mate in the middle of the board, um, and the way to do that is you actually want them to take opposition because you want your king to be cutting off these squares. So what I could do, like back here, is after you make this move, um, I can just wait with my rook. And now if you come back here, it's checkmate. And if you run away, I'm going to close in and offer you the same situation. If you run away, I'm going to do the same thing, and now you have no option. So that's another way to do it. There's lots of ways to get this ending, but essentially the principle is we're gonna have to lose a tempo. Whether we do that by moving the rook one farther back, whether we do that by triangulation, um, as long as you understand that principle, you'll be good. Any questions on the king and rook? Was that clear or do people ever feel good? Okay, so real quick, just running through it one more time. We make a box. Uh, we can make it smaller, but I'm going to bring the king in a little bit because I need my king to support. We're going to make this box smaller. And anytime we can, I'm just happy to make the box smaller. In this case, I can't, so I'm going to move my king closer. When I can take opposition, I do so. I'm going to make the box smaller. Uh, in this case, I can make the box smaller by taking opposition, so I'm going to do that. And if my opponent ever takes opposition from me, I have options, but to me, I'm just going to triangulate. Uh, I could make the box smaller here, or I can make this triangle pattern and then keep making it smaller. Once I have you on the edge of the board, I just have to understand which tempo I need to get to you at. In this case, it works out, and I get a checkmate. Any final questions before we move on to the next thing? Okay. So I thought we would wrap up today's lesson. We got about, I think, 20 minutes left with a few different other checkmating examples uh, that focus on the rook. So here's some ways that in games, um, I'm glad to hear that helps a lot. It's a, it's a really good one to know. Okay, so we looked at this last week. We looked at back ranks. Um, and the basic idea here is the rook, and really the queen as well, but the rook especially because it hits these horizontals, is very useful in this type of position where the king is stuck behind either their own pawns or our pieces are controlling these squares um, and they only can go to the side, which means we can hit them all. The reason this is such a common position is because this is like the natural result of castling. So you see it a lot. It's really important to keep an eye out for this because it happens a lot. But the basic premise is the king cannot move anywhere except for this rank. It could also be on a file, but that's more unusual, right? Ranks happen when we castle. So we can get this checkmate. Because of this principle, it actually opens up some examples. So these are going to be a little more advanced. But here's our first example here. And it is black to move and using, it might not exactly end up in a back rank, but using some of the principles of back rank, we are going to be able to win this game. Even though we're actually down a uh, queen for a rook. So what might we do in this position to gain an advantage here? Uh, A6. H6, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Bishop H6 check. Okay. And now black is in a conundrum. Sorry, white's in a conundrum. Hello, liberated toaster. Uh, because if you move the king, you're getting back ranked, right? Because of that, you have 
really two options. You could throw all of your pieces in the way. Uh, eventually, you're going to have to throw the rook in the way anyway, so it's better to just start with that. And what would we do here? With what? The bishop or the rook? Okay, uh, this is a, a not trivial decision, so let's really calculate this out. One of these leads to a win, and one of them leads to a draw, I believe. Um, might even be worse than that. If we take with the rook, what is white going to play? So our rook's no longer defended. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have to be careful of that. Yeah. If we take with the bishop, what is black? Or sorry, what is white going to play? Um, king to e eight. Uh, well, there's d eight or b eight, or sorry, d one or b one. So which one? Oh, I think is better. Yeah, I I am curious. I don't actually know if they go here. They're setting up for a back rank, but unfortunately we don't really have anything great to attack. Maybe in this position we would just simply play here and we're threatening to come down. But I think this is actually going to be a draw. If they go to d1, it's a similar idea. We can now move the bishop, um, but the problem is, again, there's not really a great discovery idea for it. So maybe it would just be something like this and we have to repeat. So, unfortunately, taking with the bishop doesn't work. Funny enough, this is actually the move. We take with the rook. And yes, our rook hangs, but we have a great follow-up. Take. Take. Check. Brutal. And we get win a rook and a queen for a rook. If you do this, unfortunately, I can't back rank you because I'm pinned, but I do win a queen. Um, and you can't go anywhere else. So, does the principle of that one make sense? Let's go to our next example here. Black to move. D seven check. Uh, bishop d7, check. Okay. Uh, I can't push the pawn because it's pinned, so bishop d7, I will play king to a5. Okay, I will block with the bishop. I will take with the king. So check, king, check, bishop. We still have this rook here. We have a queen, although it's kind of guarded. Wait in that position, then move the rook down. Yeah. And check the king. And then you can take. And then if the queen takes, take back with the queen, and then it's mate. Yeah. So if queen takes, this would be mate, and we'll look at that in a second. What if um. Now we can move this pawn to block. Then we take uh, the other pawn, which is queen. Uh, it's defended? <laughs> it's okay. We're looking pretty far ahead. Uh, bishop b3. Uh, our bishop's going to be on d7 in this variation. And then capture rook b5. Bishop. Five. Oh, oh yeah, liberate toaster. Yeah, I think you got the final killing blow. So let's take a look at this. It's funny, you can actually win this with rook a5. It's a very different checkmate. Um, but, like, you actually draw the king out into the middle of the board. This one is our kind of back rank idea. We notice that the king really is pretty limited right now, and we would love to just deliver this checkmate, but the king has an escape square. Again, this is going to work, but it's going to be weird. Um, I can show you that if you want in a minute. But 
First, we take away the escape square. He moves up. And now we have all of these squares covered. So we check, forcing them to block. We check again. And if they were to take, we take. And now this is Maiden 2. So they can't take with the queen. They now block with the pawn. And here's the kicker is, yeah, Liberated Toaster, you capture on b5. Defended and pinned. So king has to move back. And this is a back rank checkmate. Kind of also a ladder mate. Um, real quick, I'll show you this one because it's funny. If you play rook a8, uh, king comes to b5. Now we go bishop d7. King comes to c5. And there's rook to a5, rook sacrifice check. Because if the pawn takes, then the queen bounces to f8. And then to a8. And then to c6. And this is checkmate. Really, really strange. Um, that's going to be a lot harder to calculate for me. So I'm going to stick with the back rank. But if you see that variation, you're welcome to use it. <laughs> All right, our third back rank example here. How should white continue? Um, Where? Um, uh, here, I assume? Yeah. Okay, queen takes. Okay, um, I have a move. I might just play like h6 or something. So I'm not, yeah, unfortunately, I have I have one move there. So that's not going to gain us anything. We're not necessarily losing, but I think black's in a better position with these rooks here on the second. So we have to be careful not to give them too much time. Any other suggestions here? Okay, Arcane Doctrine, Rook. Uh, oh, we already looked at D8, yeah. So D8, unfortunately, doesn't quite work. Sorry, Tracy, you had an idea? Yeah, I was going to say, Queen to D8, Queen takes D8, Bishop takes D8, then Rook takes D8. So Queen, Queen, Bishop, Black has a move. So yeah, this is unfortunately not quite fast enough, and now we're going to have to fight these rooks. Mm -hmm. Yes, and a few people have found the right idea. Rook e8 doesn't work because we can set, force the queen to go away and we get a bishop, but the bishop's not worth the rook, plus there's too much trouble. But some people have noticed that you can actually solve it by reversing the order. We take the bishop first, and the queen can't take back it has to guard this back rank right mm -hmm. if they take our queen we win the game so this is actually just really rough and it's also well it's not actually it might almost be a queen trap it's very close i think the queen's gonna have to run all the way over here um and now we just have this extra bishop we have a pawn that's ready to promote so i think actually we can survive this see so yeah, really good for the people who found that one the other thing to notice in this position is this is a little introduction to the next one is when we have two rooks on the second um, we have to be very careful if this bishop wasn't here would be an even more danger because it's at least giving some defense but this actually leads into another kind of rook checkmate called the blind swine mate and here's the basic example um, some kind of position like this how does white win here would be fairly intuitive okay we take king has one move okay king has one move the other rook comes in. Yeah, if we move this one back, it's just a repeat. So this one comes in. Not there. That's a loss. Um, or at least a draw, maybe. I don't know. Um, and we cover all the squares. So this is the idea of the blind swine mate. It's one of the reasons why having rooks doubled on the seventh is so powerful. So let's take a look at one example here. In this position, uh, pieces are about equal, but black is actually really close to promoting a pawn and getting a queen. So is there a way, like, right, for instance, if we were to take this knight, then they can get a queen. So how should white continue in this position? 
a uh, blind swine is what this is called. So like swine like pig. I don't know where it gets the name. So sacrifice the rook on um F seven. Okay. Uh rook takes. Well, mm hmm So this is a back rank problem. Are knights covering these escape squares? We've got to keep that in mind. Now we cover all the squares. So that's really good. So you can't take... So they're going to have to play something else. Uh, not really much else to play. If I just move my rook out of the way, let's say. Threaten your knight. Now what? Mm -hmm. And it's the same pattern... And now our knight's the one controlling this final square. So we get our same blind swing. Yeah, it's, the, yeah, it's the same exact thing, right? Exactly. So if we take, if you promote to a queen, there's no time to do anything with it because we get this first. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really powerful thing. Even the queen is not enough to stop this. Look at one more blind swine example here. Black to move. Which rook? The C rook or the D rook? C, yeah. Okay, and this is right because, I mean, doubling up is nice, but we don't need to put pressure here. We need to put pressure here. Okay, uh, if I take... Back rank, right? We always got to be watching out for that, right? Even if the pawns aren't there, this is still a checkmate. Or, well, it's... it's. I mean, it's going to be checkmate, yeah. It's the, it's the pattern. Um, okay, so we take, obviously can't do that, so let's say rook to e1. Okay, this one's a little different, right? Because now, they still have an open square, so what can we do here? Uh, where? Yeah, so we can't back this one up because then that leaves this undefended. So like you said, rook on g3. Yeah, and uh, we're threatening... Well, well, let's see, what is the threat? Let's say I just push a pawn. Uh, not quite. I have an escape here. Here? Yes. Okay. Go back. Is it, is it, um, the queen's about to promote? Yeah, we got to be careful of this queen. Uh, well, we got... See. We can we can repeat here. If, if so, at very least we have a draw. Um, but can we get a win? Oh, it's the end of the rook because the knights protect all over to the king. That's it. Easy to miss, but yeah, our knight is uh, guarding everything here, so we, we get to cover everything. Problem with here is we lose this square, but here it works. Really good. Yeah, Liberated Toaster, you found that as well, Rook F2. Really nice. All right, five minutes left. Let's look at one more pattern here. Also really, really cool. Um, this one's called Anastasia's Mate. Similar to back rank, right, these things we've seen, uh, but in, it involves a knight. Uh, I guess a bishop could be here covering these squares, but this is, it's at least called an Anastasia's when you see this. And yeah, this one's not the hard one. Uh, rook A1 yeah. is the idea, and it's similar to a back rank where all of these squares are controlled. Mm -hmm. But this is another really useful one because it comes in handy uh, a few times. So let's see. I'm going to go to example two here first, actually, because example one is from a really cool game. 
So in this position, keeping in mind our pattern, how can, uh, and I'll go back to it real quick just so we can remind ourselves. So we want to look for this kind of pattern where the knight is covering these squares and we're going to be able to deliver checkmate. So white to move. Uh, queen, so here's d1, where you want to go oh, here, uh, yeah. e8. E, e8, okay, queen e8, um, so I can't take it, right, you're looking at this back rank threat, uh, which is nice, but I wonder what I can do instead, maybe something as simple as like g6, and I think I'm okay. Our chat's screaming over here. We have a lot of suggestions here. Uh, someone is suggesting queen takes h7. But I don't see the follow-up here. I like the little... Some of the words came this though. Knight to f7 or e7. Okay, knight e7. So this is check. We can't take uh, here. King h8. Yeah, I know a lot of people are screaming in the chat. It's okay. We'll get there. We're very close. We just got to put the pieces together. I guess we can draw the king at point. Yeah, so notice we already have this position. So if we can open up this pawn and get the king there, it's good. So now we take with the queen. This has to happen after check. And now rook a5. Yeah, to everyone in the chat, uh, uh, Finvar, Royal Fork, uh, Eigen, right, I want to make sure you all, yeah, I saw what you were saying. You got it. So this is a really cool one. And I want to show the very end to a game that uh, Magnus Carlsen played when he was 12. He played this against, I believe the guy's name was John Ludwig Hammer or Hammer. And uh, Magnus seemed to get himself into a bit of a pickle, right? This knight has nowhere to go. Um, it's basically trapped. The last move played was rook to e1, trapping this knight. Uh, knight to f4 doesn't work because of queen to f3. And now we're hitting the rook and we're hitting the knight a second time. So I'm going to pick something up. So the knight is trapped. But Carlson had thought a little bit ahead. Anybody want to find our last solution today? Uh, not a5, but queen h5. Again, brutal. Out of, in the middle of nowhere in this game, 12-year-old Magnus Carlson uh, just crushes, unfortunately, his opponent's dreams so we stopped the hammering with uh, rook to h4, Anastasia's beautiful checkmate. Yeah, queen stacks are fun, but those are some of the basics. So again, hopefully we're, I wanted to have some fun with these puzzles, but hopefully you understood kind of the main point is looking at the rooks, understanding what do they do, how do they move, how can we use them? Rooks thrive in the end game and somewhat in the middle game if you can get them to the open files, if you can double them up to, to support each other. Um, and understand right how to use them. Put them behind the past pawns uh, and use them to slowly encroach space on the king. So 
again thank you everyone for joining me uh and joining all of us today hope